thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, it's such a pleasure to be in this beautiful rare book room and talking about Coco Chanel um, and this stunning work by Paul Morant, which was his last book um, that he wrote and it's based upon intimate conversations that he had with Coco Chanel. Um, and I think it paints a very uh, fascinating portrait of her um, and perhaps deepens our, might deepen our perspective and impressions of, of who she was, how she got to where she was, how she became such a legend. And um, so I wanted to kind of open with that um, and thank my all of my wonderful panelists for being here. And um, I think one of the interesting things about this book too is that it kind of brings together, we have this wonderful writer, Paul Marin, but also, you know, talking about um, this fashion icon so we can kind of cross pollinate those two worlds here and have a conversation among, you know, both the book world and the fashion world, um, which I think uh, is really fertile ground for conversation. So anyway, I wanted to, open up the conversation to our panelists about um, sort of Coco Chanel, who she was, what your impressions maybe were of her, how this book might have deepened or changed or shaken those perspectives, and also sort of what it means to be a fashion icon, how do these uh, um, legendary women or, or men kind of um, shape uh, who we are, how have they influenced you, let's say. <laughs> There's this really great novel that is set. It starts on a New Year's Eve in, I think, 1937. It's by Amor Tolls, and it came out in the past couple of years, and it's called The Rules of Civility. And it's great. If you've read it, you're totally devoted. And it's a bit like The Great Gatsby. And it spends a lot of time talking about what kind of person comes to New York. And so the narrator spends a lot of time talking about this and thinking about it. And, you know, the one roommate's very rich, the other roommate's very poor, so it's a little bit like a reality show, and you can see how it's going to play out. <laughs> it's very American. American. Uh, there's this one great line, though, where the narrator thinks about these beautiful women who come out of the Midwest sort of soaked in starlight, and they have these long limbs, and they just kind of walk into New York really effortlessly, and they sort of carry that with them forever. And that was the particular thing about being Midwestern. And one of the things that I really picked up in this book was how ambitious Coco Chanel was, and how much she had to really tell in her own story that she had lifted herself up, and that she had taken advantages of them where she could get them. But I feel like she really wants us um, in this book to to understand that about her and I sort of felt like I realized that on the third or fourth page that it really the writer is obviously very gifted and, and the language is very elegantly deployed but there was such a sense of of her story in it and her voice and her wanting you to know that she was never very far from that girl who sort of asked this man oh where are you going is it interesting and buys a ticket for his train mm -hmm. you know I think there's, um, today there's a lot of discussion about who women are and the choices that women make and the Sheryl Sandbergization of it all. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, it's become, a, you know, a part of our discourse. So we women and men are all thinking about this and thinking about Coco Chanel and her life and what she did at that time period is just so momentous. It's it's startling to me that she um, had that wherewithal. I mean, calling her a fashion icon is almost not enough for me. <laughs> um, Jesus Christ, Kim Kardashian is now considered a <laughs> fashion icon, which uh, we can talk about that later. Um, she was, Coco Chanel was something else, and I think there have been others in, in the industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, Diana Vreeland is, you know, one of these creatures. Um, I love that you say that, because I thought this book had a lot of parallels to yeah. DV. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I you know. read that, but the first line, I loathe nostalgia. <laughs> right, Come right, on. right, 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 these grand declarations. Um, yeah, so, I, I, I guess I'm feeling more awestruck by what she did and who she became. Um, she leaned in, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. It was fascinating to me to read this book, because I have to confess that I don't know very much about fashion and knew even less about Coco Chanel. And I'm reading this description of how this person, who as Susan alluded to, was maybe more than a fashion icon, not just you know, she wasn't just an icon, that she changed the entire style 
Um, and they talked about going from that slow transition from the incredible um, frillery and excess of 19th century women's fashion, the corsets and the extreme silhouettes and the ruffles and bows and ribbons to a more stripped down style. And it occurred to me that it's very much what Hemingway did for prose. Mm. A very similar transition from you know, what looks to our eye now to be a somewhat old fashioned, um, you could say ornate, you know, with no value judgment, um, an ornateness that one sees in 19th century novels and then going into the new century. And then somebody comes along with this vision that strips it all clear. And yeah, it was interesting to me to think of that as I was reading it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about that same idea of um, less is more that is sort of passed around at writing workshops, but is, you know, also applied to other art and to fashion and this idea of simplicity and impurity and things and somehow that's getting at some kind of truth, maybe. Um, and you mentioned uh, Diana Reland, and that came to my mind too as I was reading this book. And um, a particular parallel, and both of them um, who weren't, you know, formally educated. And Chanel talks about learning everything she knows from reading books, specifically novels, and um, how, you know, more cultivated people would be shocked to know that that's how she, you know, um, was educated. Um, and there's something about, you know, and Diana Reland uh, also, you know, wasn't formally educated. And I wonder if there's something about that, if we're thinking about, you know, icons and what it takes and what it means, and if there are any common denominators, you know, if any among them in terms of characteristics, qualities, like that might be, there might be something with that in that if you aren't educated and you're coming from a perspective where you're educating yourself in a different way, you're m maybe more able to think outside the box or, you know, not think in the way that everyone else is thinking. So you're able to think anew. And I just thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think she shares a lot of parallels with the most famous group of uneducated style icons in the world, which is the Mitford sisters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. None of whom, I think they had one brother who was the heir to this sort of minor title. He was sent to the best schools in England, sadly died in Burma during the war. They pretty much the seven girls or six girls, maybe five, they just had whatever their mom had time to teach them while they sort of moved around. And they uh, famously just kind of educated themselves and ended up writing books about it. Nancy became a novelist and worked in a bookstore. And I think that even more than some of the different books that they've written, um, because Jessica became a communist activist in San Francisco, not for everyone, <laughs> as, as with some other uh, areas she they moved cheat. into. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> without question. It's the only book I would ever read about funerals. And so um, I think the really interesting thing is that what survives about them is their letters. And it's this sense that if you have that kind of magpie sensibility, if we think about the people who sort of stand out and have this kind of iconic thing, it's always that sense of originality. That it's not them just sort of repeating their idea of what classic is or what trends are, but really saying like, I chose this for this specific reason and it spoke to me. And because fashion is our most sort of expressive visual language, it really comes out, that force of personality. And I think that's what's truly memorable. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, someone like Coco Chanel, who there's a little discussion about how she was actually raised. I, I know her rendition <laughs> is that her, you know, kind of mean aunties raised her aunties. Yeah. I don't know how proper we're being, but most biographers, I think, agree that she was shipped off to an orphanage and raised in a pretty awful environment. So I shouldn't, she, she doesn't seem to be, have been raised with these constraints on how she should act mm -hmm. or behave or think. I, I'm sort of skipping around a little bit, but I, 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 I feel about her that she wasn't set on becoming a fashion designer. She felt very strongly about changing the way women lived, which is different for me, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Is, is different. She was so committed to freeing women from those in corsets. <laughs> well, I mean, I think especially in the beginning of the book, we really see that desire that she has yeah. to cast off society's expectations. Like, she's not going to wear a corset, so you might as well make it trendy. Mm -hmm. And right. I think that really was exactly so much about her stamp of, I'm going to make these independent choices. I'm going to be really singular. I'm going to be really different than everyone else. Of course, there's a uniform and a way of seeing the world and a way of expressing myself that goes along with that. 
and naturally if I can kind of sell that and use that to fund it. Right. Well, and so I think, you know, she, she was quite clever and we were talking a little bit earlier yes. that, you know, she definitely wanted to put her own stamp on things, but she did it in a way that sort of conformed to society standards in certain ways. Right. I said earlier, I didn't want to say that she slept her way to the top, but a little bit, <laughs> you know, that she kind of, you know, found these very affluent, connected men, one of whom really is the one who um, bankrolled her hat shop early on and got her organized from, with a, from a business standpoint. Um, but it, 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 is, it is, you know, she kind of played the game in a way that she needed right. to. And it's interesting, what you really get in this book is a portrait of someone who's absolutely obsessed with and in love with work itself. Yeah. That comes yeah. through. And it made me think. Unapologetically. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. She comes right out and says it. You know, it wasn't even necessarily fashion. It was the work. It was the work. And it made me think if it hadn't been fashion, it would have been um, trains, you know, or like shoe stores. It's some mm -hmm. other right. thing that she would have challenged. Um, that she would have ch channeled that, that drive into. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I yeah. agree. Yeah, I, yeah, agree. I think there's a real richness to her storytelling. For instance, the section where she talks about jewelry and she says, I don't really care about jewelry, which to me was so funny because I spent quite a lot to track down some vintage Chanel pearls a few years ago and I cared quite a bit about them. But I also felt that um, I loved the, what she said though. She said, you know, it doesn't mean much to me, but it's the idea that you're wearing jewelry because you respect the people that you're with and you're showing mm -hmm. them that you've taken the time. Oh, I thought that yeah. was so fascinating. And I thought, oh, that's such a rich kind of thing. Maybe if it was 40 years later, she might have been a filmmaker, right. you, know, or she, you know, you can kind of see how things sort of happen in time. But I also think that fashion was really her metier because it was always changing and it was fast and it was fluid and she could really carve out a space there that, right. you know, almost a century later is so instant. Right. And she came in at a time when the world was changing and you know, she could reflect that and even shape it to some small extent with her fashion. But there was more freedom for women. I mean, if you like Downton Abbey, one thing that you'll <laughs> notice immediately was yeah. that fashion had to change because after uh, World War One and Two, and the sort of shortage of people and the different expectations that modernity gave everyone, you didn't have someone to dress you every morning. Right. You didn't have someone living in your house to do your laundry. Wait. So that's not going to happen anymore. Well, <laughs> maybe only on Tuesdays. <laughs> so I think that it, that was really part of it too. That she captured the zeitgeist in the sense. I have this very old traveling trunk um, from the twenties that is just to carry like your makeup. And it's so heavy, I can't even carry it across my apartment. <laughs> and I just, every time I do, I think it's just really beautiful, and I can see why someone would want it, but someone had to carry this right. between stations. Right. Well, you know, and you yeah. really had to have porters and that sort of thing. And so when all of that started to recede, she was just right there with this kind of sensibility. It was like a racehorse. It was just sort of like the next thing, you know, it's going to be a fast trip across the ocean, and mm -hmm. then it's going to be an airplane, and after that, the sky's the limit. And so I think she really captured that so well for an entire generation of women. Right. Mm -hmm. I was also, I'm, I'm so impressed with how, um, what an understanding she had developed, learned about the engineering of clothing. I mean, she really, um, she was the first one to look to men's tailoring and the way men's clothing was constructed and said, women, women should have that. Yeah. They deserve that. Um, yeah, I, I thought that was, and men's horse back again, but I just thought that was fascinating of her. Right. Something I found myself thinking of, though, um, I hadn't known much about her, as I mentioned. So I read this book, and then I went to the Wikipedia page, which, as you alluded to, um, there are certain biographical inconsistencies in her upbringing. I wonder why she felt the need to create that story. I mean, well, this you know, extraordinary, confident person. Though. It's funny. I think she was like the first woman of spin control. I mean, she right. did her own, she put her own spin on her story. Um, you know, maybe she was just a good old control freak. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, it almost felt like she really believed it. I don't know. And when I read the book, there was something. I think it was that she was in a way selling who she was. And mm -hmm. so she wanted to have that public private exchange, but still keep something of it. So it was like she had an apartment in the Ritz and then she had another apartment where she actually lived. And she right. would sort of go back yeah. and forth right. and she would have these different kind of ways that people mm. could sort of have the Chanel experience. But I think a part of her, she just sort of felt like, well, yeah, this is my story and I'll tell you that because I kind of know the truth and it's just for me. 
<laughs> Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, she says at the end of the book, and I love how the book ends with this, something like, so this is who I am. I hope you understand, but I'm also the opposite of every of all of this. But, <laughs> so, but, but there's a lot of that, in yeah, her, which is throughout the book. Um, she, she's you know, two faces of Eve. She she is you know. There's a lot of both sides of. It's very. It's fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's fascinating. I think she's also very French. Oh, <laughs> me oui. totally okay oh, with me that. Oui. Yeah, I mean, I think that she, you know, there's the sensibility that complexity is fine. You don't have to explain it. Things can have more than one meeting, and they can totally coexist in the same sphere and in some ways be more appreciable for that. Yeah, you can be a complete go-getter on the forefront of fashion innovation and still need a man. Yeah, the thing, she certainly understood that. The thing yes. that I love is that I recently read this really great biography called... Um, the Girl with the Camellias, that's about this young sort of courtesan who pretty much is the inspiration for the opera, any opera, where the girl dies. And Isn't that every opera? Yes. <laughs> and so, but specifically, um, La Boheme. And so she lived this sort of burning through life like a comet life in France, and she sort of rose up out of the countryside, and she was this peasant girl who reinvents herself. But her thing was that she loved camellias, and she was always seen in camellias, and she was draped in camellias, and everywhere you went, you knew that that was her. And then Sandra Bernhard made the play about her life famous, and she really was the originator of all that. And I thought that was so interesting. There was like one line that said, and later maybe Coco Chanel sort of picked up on this. And I think about that a lot, because I like to read women's stories in history because I think when there's a biography of a famous man who's already chronicled so much of what he did, the revelation is always like he slept with his housekeeper. And then if you read about sort of an interesting woman, I find half the time you've never heard of her right. because she's just been erased from history because she lived her life in some way that was totally not cool in that village. Or she just, you know, <laughs> was like Eloise and Abelard and was going to do what she wanted and we're still talking about it a thousand years later. And so the thing that I particularly loved about this book is she wins in the end. Like, she's fine. Oh, yeah. She's sort of like, there you go. And that is a pretty unusual ending for someone who's lived life on her own terms. Mm -hmm. At least in my experience as a reader. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, just the way you're talking about... Um, burning through life and I feel like she definitely possessed that quality and she talked about um, you know just not having chosen the profession of dressmaking but just kind of doing it not really thinking so much about it and just kind of barreling ahead and not stopping to think am I happy do I want to have kids do I you know it was like just there wasn't this kind of you know <laughs> hyper critical you know thing going on that I feel like um, many people or at least I feel like I wouldn't I would ask myself a million questions before I became a dressmaker or, you know but she just kind of went down this path and didn't look back and worked really hard and seemed really driven just by this idea of freedom and wanting to uh, make enough money money to her meant freedom you know and I think she was you know, trying to fight her way out of her childhood, having never felt free, rebelling against that, and to her, the way out was making money, and she didn't care what she was doing mm -hmm. as long as she was able to make that money and be free, which kind of made me also think about, you know, fashion and its role in, um, in empowering women and freedom, and what is it about fashion that you know, that I feel like it's a little bit of a phenomenon that you can try and address and feel like a completely different person or, you know. Right. There's this old idea that clothes are armor, mm -hmm. which I do subscribe to to a certain point. Um, to a certain point, it's, you know, that you can shape the way the world sees you by means of how you dress. And, you know, I think that's one of fashion's main, um, main attributes, main appeals for a lot of people, myself included, I'd say. I'm, yeah, and that dovetails in kind of interesting way with the idea of freedom. It's mm -hmm. control over your image and not being trapped by the way other people see you. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. I think she wanted this idea of, you know, women having access to that sense of a uniform. That if you're a man, you can go to a formal thing at a hotel and you can wear a tuxedo and you're well-dressed. But if you're a woman and you're kind of wearing maybe the wrong color 
where there's some sort of feather thing happening and it doesn't <laughs> go over right and everyone's like, well, it's so clear the mistake that she has made. And I think that men really operate in the total absence of that kind of judgment in that way. And I think in a sense, she was very specific in the, the idea that she was like, I want to use these sort of fabrics that we associate with you know, jockeys or with shepherds or that sort of thing. And I want to get rid of like the ostrich feather on a hat, which at that moment when she swept under the scene was sort of the height of chic and elegance. And she just stripped it away and said, you know, we're just going to have this very basic accessible standard, but it's going to be there and it's going to be real. And that is going to liberate women in a sense mm -hmm. because there won't be so much sort of arguing over ornament because like, you know, this is the style right. from now on. Mm -hmm. She brings up um, a distinction between prettiness and beauty, um, which I think is an interesting thing to, to talk about. Um, she talks about uh, beauty as being something that isn't taught and uh, prettiness being something that is taught and something that everyone desires, but not necessarily being beautiful. Um, and, and this is kind of her own definition, or maybe at the time the way those two words were used. But um, I think maybe what she was hinting at or, or implying and um, is that something with beauty is there's something deeper than 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 the fashion or it combines the fashion with something else deeper whereas prettiness is more um, superficial did, did that strike you that um, kind of difference that she she makes in the two and what, what thoughts do you have I mean I think that that's a great example of her French sensibility um, again I, I, th I think you know this part this running through this vein running through her of you know not interested in ornament ornamentation for the sake of it um, mm -hmm. shapes and fabrics that allow the body to move she it was a, they were they were two different categories to mm -hmm. her and it, I mean which was a very very forward sensibility. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it also has a lot to do with age in the mm -hmm. sense that she would have been the first to tell you that she was really at the height of her style and the height of her power and the height of her own beauty relatively later in life, you know, a couple of decades after she burst onto the scene, certainly when she was dating the Duke of Westminster. And so I think that it's a little bit of that as well, this idea, you know, glamour is this old Gaelic word that means a spell that you cast on someone to make them think something. And until the 20th century, it was considered a kind of like nasty sort of magic. And then in the 20s, we repurposed that to mean sophisticated. Right. And that became a thing. Like now you wanted to be glamorous because you could right. be on television or you could be in the newspaper. And suddenly like sort of teleporting your image in a way that was separate from actually interacting with you had a kind of cultural currency. And I think that she was starting to kind of see that, that there was the sense of celebrity being a new thing very much in her lifetime, very much this idea that, you know, she was really kind of pioneering and thinking of this, this season that is in fashion like resort, you know, obviously right. popularizing the tan and other things like that and sportswear. And I think she just really understood that, that there was a kind of development of your style and that mm -hmm. you can be lovely and pretty and young and you can be something quite different when you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. right. mm. So another thing I wanted to ask about is um, how have you know, how has either Chanel or another fashion icon or something, or someone like this um, maybe influenced you in your own lives um, personally or or did any of these things that um, um, that are talked about in, in the book strike you as being or resonate with you as uh, in a personal way? Well, I, I mean, I have to say the first designer I interviewed, I don't know, 115 years ago <laughs> um, was Donna Karen when she, and I did think about her when I read this book because mm -hmm. I don't know what y'all think of her now or what your impression is of her, but in the 80s, when she really came on the scene um, with a lot of fits and spurts, um, she changed women's workwear. I mean, she mm -hmm. revolutionized the way women dress to go to work. And I, I thought of her a lot, and I thought about that first meeting. My God, I mean, I thought so much about that first meeting and how I've interviewed her since then and she's 
quite spacey, really spacey, but at that time she was so driven and so determined to change to help women mm -hmm. dress like women who could conquer who could climb that ladder and and she had this very much the attitude of she did not care what anybody else thought she the floppy bows and the awful blouses she was like uh, I'm done. I'm done. I don't care. And she took so much shit for it. Um, but that determination, that fire. So I, for me, I really kept thinking about her. And Donna Karen definitely made a huge impact on me personally and um, really confirmed my interest in covering this industry and working in this business. Um, so so I, I kind of went there with it. I found myself comparing the incredible discipline that Chanel seemed to have had seem to have had with with writers that I've known you know, the people who have done this for decades and just the idea that this is what it takes this incredible single-mindedness this incredible discipline and it's kind of the same thing you know whether you're designing a fashion collection and building a name for yourself and changing the way women dress or whether you're writing a body of work or whether you're a painter it was it was fascinating to me to see that parallel in terms of the drive across disciplines I absolutely aspire to live at the Ritz and date Dukes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that struck me too. She, there's, she says something like, I hate when people say that I've been lucky. Nobody has worked harder than me. And um, of course, everyone has some luck in their lives. And she does uh, speak of Boy Capel, her first um, love as being a stroke of luck in her life but she also worked very very hard and she talks about not going out in the evenings all the time because she you know would had work the next day and you know she had people kind of and again who knows how true this portrait is of, 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 of reality but um I thought that was interesting, but she had people that she knew going to these parties and she would get the scoop afterward and she still wanted to know what was being said and who was seeing whom and, you know, so she kind of always kept her finger on the pulse and even when she wasn't maybe physically there. Uh, I mean, it, it just, it really bugs me, this, um, that women who have great drive, determination, talent, and aspiration. It's described as luck. Like, really? Mm -hmm. so I, uh, luck? <laughs> you make your own luck. I mean, they're all, you know, these, these quips about it. But it, it's a very, you know, I think it's a very male way of looking at things that women, you know, I've heard this over and over and over again. And I just, I don't buy it. I don't <laughs> buy it. I think she was constantly working, thinking, every social interaction, somehow affected her work the way mm -hmm. she made uh, she used every everything in her in her arsenal every tool to create this this business mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it has endured which is also so you know phenomenal to me mm -hmm. the, the endurance of the, and the look and, and not just that it's endured but that it's retained that kind of iconic status in the absence of the founder I think that's really yes. interesting that you can have mm -hmm. enough of a sort of resonating collective memory of what was so powerfully chic about this person that it just goes on and on and on and every season it can be different and it can be reinterpreted and there's these sort of gestures like tweed or pearls that you recognize that become a part of it and they evolve and I think that's so true to her spirit that mm -hmm. idea that fashion is an evolution and that it, it keeps on you know taking similar elements and recognizable characters, but inventing entirely new storylines. Yeah. I wonder what she would think of, um, like the H&Ms and the Zaras. Of her. I wonder what, I don't know, I mean, I'm just, I just I think I think we know what she would think. <laughs> <laughs> she who, right, who loved yeah. great fabric and great tailoring and appreciate. Right. It's true, it's a brave new world. But it, it brings style to the masses. It's the motivation of fashion. I don't know, I just think about, I wonder about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, she reading this book, she is not, you know, she's so quotable, and I underlined the book, you know, I was constantly underlining because she just has these terrific quotes. Um, but, you know, sometimes she just, she's very, she does have this, um, this certain fierceness that is 
kind of startling at times and she but that seems to be so much of, of of, and she talks a lot about her pride and being stubborn and just, you know, not really caring what other people think, um, even though she, you know, wanted to know what others were saying. But um, just this this very focused mm -hmm. kind of, you know, characteristic that she had that I think really um, lended her to being as, you know, as successful as she was. Right. Yeah, I mean, she really goes out of her way to say that she likes eccentricity. She's interested in it, but it's not for her. And I think mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons that she was such a successful designer. Because we can all think of, like, really interesting designers who are like, you know what I'm going to make? I'm going to make a dress that's like a balloon animal. <laughs> and that's great. And it says but something. Try wearing it. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And, you know, or there's just really cool, quirky people who have a ton of sense and a ton of taste but cannot run a business or find investors to save their life. And so, mm -hmm. you know, every now and then something shows up and it's really evocative. And I think that she just was so clear in her sense that she wanted to be stimulated and she wanted to be inspired. But yeah, she had this kind of iron will and, and she was gonna do things her way. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a line in the book that actually disturbed me. It was something she said, um, kind of along the lines of this iron will and unchangeability. She said, I don't like to change my ideas. And I have to say, I find that slightly horrifying. <laughs> so, you know, Novelists have to change their ideas. I, I guess, I guess that's it. But yeah, there are elements of her personality as it comes across in this book that were appalling to me, um, <laughs> which in no way detracts from her importance as an icon or the work that she did or her impact. But it's an interest. Yeah, it was an interesting read. I think it's the same thing with Diana Freeland or anyone mm -hmm. who you have like read three quotes by them and you think, I would love to live with her. <laughs> and you read the book. <laughs> you read the book and you're like, no one could live with her. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Do you want to open it up to questions? Yeah, I'm running a little on time, but we do have a few minutes. If anyone has any questions or comments for our panel this evening, free raise your hand. Start out there. Hi, um, do you guys think that she's portrayed differently in this book than she is in Coco Porsche movie? I have not seen it. I think in the movie it was a little bit more about someone else telling her story. Like I felt in the movie, I remember one of the scenes, um, she's putting a dress into a drawer and it's pleated perfectly, like pleated so perfectly that I was like, that looks exactly like the skirt I was looking at at the shop on Avenue Montaigne like two weeks ago, you know, and it was such a beautiful kind of Chanel presentation. Um, and this book I think is more like reading her diary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's like a beautiful profile in the style section. That was my sense of it, where yeah. she's just sort of like, here you go. Kind of like if we had Twitter yeah, 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 yeah. 60 years ago and you were like, I maybe wouldn't say that today, but guess what? There it is. Right. This is like, this is like, yeah, kind of like a yeah. Twitter feed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 But like as in the way she's portraying that movie, do you think it, you know, is reflective of, like, do you think it is in line with how she portrays herself? Yeah, absolutely. I think she really saw herself as having a complicated, messy, but ultimately very orderly life. You know, so I, I think that both things kind of had a lot of, there's a big comparison there. Like, I don't think that she would say to you, like, I'm this way or that way, and I think in the movie that comes across, and I think in the book it comes across as well, especially with the ending, which is a bit ambiguous, but you know that it works out for her. Sure. <laughs> Are the books good? It, it's really, it's really <laughs> fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I just moved to the city like two weeks ago from Virginia, like came out of nowhere, I do a million jobs, and got this like kind of crappy fashion internship. <laughs> <laughs> then you're, <laughs> you're gonna need to read this book. Yeah. 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 Like the kind of H&M style, and like being someone who was an art major or also writes on the side is like killing me inside a little bit. But and what they want me to do is like these like. <laughs> right. so. yeah. But Chanel would want you to succeed in that, and she would also want you to go to the Met on like free Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> and she would, she would want you to go to the bar at the Carlisle, <laughs> and a few other things. But I would start with the book. You want to start sleeping with a marry a rich married guy? How about it? How about it? Serendipitously, I came today. Thank you. Uh, I don't know.
Sorry about the Super Bowl. So, <laughs> you did not. <laughs> see, she, she went. See, so you you're living the sh that, that's, that would be a Chanel a Chanelian moment. Yeah, there's a huge toboggan slide in Times Square. If you haven't been, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Times know. Square, it's like blocked off for like, right, twenty blocks. Like, like right so oh wow! So that's how you got here. Where, <laughs> where I was at seven Times Square last night. Like We're at 14, Oh, yeah, right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> another one down here. Uh, okay, so this might be a little tricky and like, random, but why do you think fashion is coming now? Oh, it's going now. Because I think Chanel did so much. Like, it was a giant step. Like, you had all the corsets and all the uh, feathers and all. And she took it all, like, so quick that fashion uh, made an evolution very quickly and I don't see where else it could go right now. Like, just some animal balloon thing, <laughs> some kind of eccentric <laughs> stuff, but do you think it has somewhere like to evolve really? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think the next big stage in fashion is going to be wearable fabrics that are influenced by technology that gathers information about the wearer. So like a coat or a sweater that becomes warmer or cooler depending on your mood and your kind of climate. I think that 3D printing is massive. You know, I think that fashion very much responds to the characteristics of the society that we're all living in. And so she was very much a creature of her time and she was that was the moment that transportation became possible. Like when you were, you know, a young woman living in a very small town, you could wear 14 skirts because you were only going to go like outside without your husband or father for 10 minutes, you know, and sit in the garden with Proust for <laughs> right, right, 30 yeah. years. And so I think that, um, you know, she went in that direction of just being unfettered and being really free. And I think that's probably the next stage is the sense that, you know, technology, and printing and production will sort of liberate us from the last kind of, doesn't seem like a burden now, but it's always 50 years later that you're like, can you believe people used to layer? Isn't that quaint? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't really know. Um, I, I don't have any kind of fashion crystal ball. Um, I will say, you know, I'm a little glum about kind of what has happened to fashion. I'm, um, the pressure on deliveries every six weeks has created this market for schlock um, that is so troubling to me to say to sorry to, I mean I listen I'm sweetheart I'm, I'm in it too yeah I mean <laughs> right yeah no 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 no, no. I'm I, yeah, for sure uh, to say nothing of the conditions under which the schlock is being made um, I, I I'm, I'm troubled um, not quite optimistic yet. Uh, I'd I, I'm hoping that we will become more interested in the less is more philosophy of life. I, I'd like to think that we are becoming more um, responsible about our consumption. And um, this is not an American thing. This is a worldwide thing. And I think it's happening. I think you young people are on to something. <laughs> um, that there, I do believe. I, I do believe there's a movement for less is more. I think people are rethinking um, all that we are buying and the size of everything and the insult on to our environment. I, I do think that young people, I'm not a part of that anymore, <laughs> are really um, f finding that and living that more. So I, I'm sort of hoping <laughs> that fashion will become more of that. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's true. I also spent an hour in a dress shop in Brooklyn today having a designer 
you know, measure me to make a What'd coat and a dress. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a coat to wear in London and this like gold brocade dress and oh, it's going to wow. be two inches longer because I was like, I'm not quite that kind of girl. You, and, you um, had me a brocade. Huh? <laughs> and, uh, and I was thinking, you know, it's quite cool that some things change and you think like, oh, the world is going by so fast. But that sort of experience that one person like Chanel or sort of one designer, or one dressmaker can really kind of help you tell a story about yourself that impacts your life. Like the moment you step out the door, I think that's her sort of enduring influence, mm -hmm. at least for me. Mm -hmm. We have time for just one more. Okay. We have a little lot of back and forth. Here's my question, but A woman who presumes she never enters the room before she does, or maybe it's the other way around. A woman presumes she doesn't linger after she leaves the room. And I think when I first heard that, I was like, oh, great. You know, it, it seems sort of very feminine and, and sort of material because she's got something that is subtle as perfume. And yet, I think that it says a lot about personal choices and, and expressing yourself through that. I think there's a lot of responsibility. But really, what I want to get at is why I can list on only one, maybe one and a half hands the number of women who are such important members of fashion and made such um, revolutionary changes to the fashion industry, and, and what the panel thinks about the fact that, that there are so few really have the sort of timeless icon and iconography that sort of doesn't fade. Well, I think you have to make a decision as to how much you want to participate in the like machinery of mass production. Like the reality is I think that there are maybe three or four fashion designers who we're told constantly are iconic in magazines, but if you look at a magazine from 20 years ago, you wouldn't recognize 80% of those names. And I just think just so much of that is manufactured and it's just created for buzz and sales. And yeah, I really... It's like 90s world in every window that you walk past. I lived at the first time, sister. <laughs> 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 I think that, you know, for me, it's like there's the designers that speak to me, like Anne de Moulamister, um in Antwerp, like going to her store. It's like a pivotal moment in my life because I just was like, oh, wow, this is such a rebuke to the kind of idea that I always had growing up in the US about success and fame. Like she could have gone to Paris, she could have gone to London, she could have gone to New York, and instead she was like, I'm gonna stay in Antwerp, I'm gonna open a really perfect shop in an old kind of warehouse, and I'm just gonna live my life because I feel really inspired by this place. And I think that we have this whole movement and culture back to kind of locavores and doing things that way. And so, yeah, there's those pyramids all the time where there's only room for one or two people at the top, but I feel like if someone's popular with everyone, they just don't have much for me. You know, it's, it's all quite personal. I, I, I guess I, I don't know what the parameters are of, you know, success or, I mean, there are a lot of women who are, you know, I don't know that they're changing fashion, but that they are women working successful in the business and um, you know there's there are the Maria Cornejos of the world someone I, I like very much who's you know kind of doing a small thing and it's not for the masses and but I, I think she's doing beautiful things and is respected and thinking and and then there's Tori Birch who Okay, groans, I'm hearing it. However, I, I, okay, bear with me. I liken Tory Burch to Victoria's Secret. I'll tell you why. <laughs> Victoria's Secret brought undergarments to the masses. The interest in undergarments, the need for undergarments, for fit, they brought it to the masses. And Tory Burch, in her way, I mean, have you been to the Midwest? You know, we live in our bubble of New York where everything is cool and artistic and different and you know, we love the dress made out of balloons or whatever. But, you know, I, I just think, that, you know, Diane von Furstenberg. I mean, here's someone who's been working at it for a long time, still doing that wrap dress, but, you know, has reached this mass marketplace 
Um, I, I, I see. I think there are a lot of people doing it. I mean, Vera Wang has been doing it for a long time. Donna Karen. I think there are a lot of people still doing it. So I don't know. I, I think. Yeah. I mean, I guess I didn't mean to say that there aren't successful women. Like, absolutely, think that there are a lot of successful business women who are in the fashion industry, but maybe just in sort of like revolutionary way, sort of changing the game. And, and not to say that Tori Burch hasn't um, been successful at her business, but I don't necessarily see anything in her aesthetic. She brought E-Cat prints to the Midwest. <laughs> they didn't know an E-Cat print from a leopard print. I'm just saying, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not defending. Game changers like Chanel, mm -hmm. male, female, uh, not, 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 a lot, not a lot. Not a lot. Not a lot. YSL, I don't, I, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, one, one a century. Also, I think she's not like a fashion icon. She's a fashion goddess. She's like it's. A, there's the, we need another term. Everyone, put on your thinking caps. <laughs> Let's come up with it. <laughs> I don't know if you went to the Schiaparelli Prada show. Oh, wasn't that fascinating? A couple of years ago, and, and that was really interesting because, um, you know, that was a designer that was as big as Chanel while making hats that are like lobster shaped, yeah. which is really revolutionary. Right. <laughs> um, and then, of course, there's that uh, the idea that, like, if you don't have a business and someone isn't preserving your legacy and there's not a kind of atelier that lives on after you, then maybe it gets survived by future generations, maybe it doesn't. But I thought that was really interesting, the sort of direct link with Prada yeah. and this idea that, I you thought know... Of Prada. I thought of Butcher Prada when I read this book yeah. a lot. I mean, just she, doing she's thing. Doing, doing, her, doing her thing. Ugly, beautiful. Uh, you be the judge. Yeah, same with Marnie. Yep, 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 yep. Marnie, yep. Well, that's about all the time we have for tonight. Thank you. On behalf of this thank, you. thank you to our wonderful panel thank and to Brittany and Christian Press for putting this together this evening. Thank you guys for braving the cold. Make sure you check out a copy of the Allure of Chanel on your way out. Thank you. Thank you.